Hey, Chris, welcome to the Beyond Jaws podcast. Are you ready to talk about shark photography and shark conservation? Absolutely, Andrew. Hello, Dave. Really looking forward to it and talking about my favorite subject, sharks. Let's go for it. <laughs> All right. That was great. Love it's, it. It's, it's, love it. It's, it's, a, it's a real special day for me because I got someone on from South Africa, my a sort of adopted home country after, after my native country in the United States. And, and today is amazing. We have Chris Fallows world-renowned wildlife photographer whose images of breaching white sharks have been featured on Discovery Channel, Shark Week, National Geographic, BBC. Uh, he's worked with David Attenborough and a number of other sharky programs over the last 30 years. And so, and, and Chris has one of those jobs that everybody who growing up at some point thinks like, wow, I want to be a wildlife photographer. Well, hopefully Chris can explain to you today how, how easy it is to become a wild, world-renowned wildlife photographer. Chris, welcome to the show. And, Thanks, Dave. Uh, loving, loving being here and really looking forward to hearing your questions. Cool. Well, let's, let's start awesome. off. Like, why, don't you, why, don't you, why don't you tell us how you um, got interested in, in, in just photography and wildlife in general? So I was very lucky that from the earliest of ages, uh, I had a father who was a keen amateur wildlife photographer. And when we lived in Johannesburg, uh, we were pretty close to the Kruger National Park, which is one of Africa's famous uh, parks. And uh, from the age of one years old, I was frisked off to those pas parks and I got an early indoctrination and exposure to wildlife. And um, I'm one of those very lucky people in that I've always wanted to work with animals or wildlife my entire life. And that comes from, you know, that exposure at an early age. In fact, my earliest memory in life is being chased up a tree by a, an angry, angry warthog that I was probably teasing or tormenting. So it, it's, it's always been wildlife and, um, yeah, just a, an in, incredible privilege to have, have, have had that as a passion from almost day one. I have to uh, ask, when you're, in a, when you're in a situation like that, when you're a kid, you're getting chased by a, an angry warthog, uh, obviously in a dangerous situation. Uh, what makes you want to go back sort of into that wildlife scenery and explore animals after a situation like that? <laughs> well, well, warthogs aren't too bad, to be quite honest. They're just like the the angry Staffordshire Bull Terrier next door or something like that. So they, they're not too scary. But to, to be honest, you know, um, by having exposure to wildlife from a young age, you as a kid, you actually see the true side of animals. You don't understand what necessarily has been written about them in the press or, or how we perceive them as adults and, and all the idiosyncrasies we carry with us. So you you see them in the most pure light when you're a child. And I think I saw a lot of these animals for what they were. You know, they, they weren't out there necessarily trying to catch me or hurt me unless I teased them like I did the warthogs. Um, so, you know, I, I, I just was naturally attracted to them. I've never feared them. I've always respected them. And I think it was due to that early exposure that, you know, I've always felt comfortable with them. Um, I certainly do know of their incredible capabilities as, as predators and what they can do to me. But quite distinctly, I know on the other side that they want to go about their own business. And generally, that doesn't involve attacking or, or hurting humans. Gotcha. That makes, that makes yeah. complete sense. Was there any, when, when you're starting out early and you kind of decide early on you wanted to do wildlife photography and your dad was taking you up there, was there any... How did you like when you got to like say high school and stuff, and you're really thinking like I want to pursue this? Was there any type type of path you thought like you needed to do to help help improve your skills, or was it just going out taking pictures and and in the in wildlife and just trying to improve on that? You know, Dave, it really wasn't a case of the photography was what what drove me as a kid. It was always a, a passion for nature and natural history. And it was always a case of wanting to go out and see more and learn more about them. And the camera became an extension of that. Um, you know, wildlife photography is as much about a passion as, as it is about a challenge. And you're always trying to capture the scene in front of you, you're always trying to do justice and to, to the essence of your subject. So that came as, a, as an extension later on in my life. I, I'd had an exposure to it through my father, but um, it was really when I started working with the great white sharks that, you know, uh, I'll, and I'm sure we'll touch on this, but I, I, I was exposed to some truly incredible and unique behavior that kind of catapulted my photographic career and that, I, you know, I was the lucky guy at the right spot at the right time to take some photographs that uh, I guess the world wanted to see and that 
really helped you know further my photographic career very quickly so it was essentially getting to know my subjects more than you know being a, a technically very good photographer that um you know was my strength getting to know your subjects when you work with wildlife is a is a tremendous asset it allows you to kind of position yourself ahead of the time knowing what your your subject matter is likely to do and you know that that anticipation and preparation ultimately leads to being in the right spot more often than not so would you when you when you saw these animals and and you know there's obviously a curious passion that that comes about when you're learning about these animals there's one thing to learn about them when you see them in person but then there's another to do you know look them up and find out why they do certain behaviors and so forth did you do a lot of research you know through high school and even after on the animals afterwards like in terms of not just observational but go up and read about them talk to people about them uh, other scientists and so forth like how did you get that information on them in terms of like here's a behavior that i'm seeing why are they doing this this behavior yeah absolutely you know you you're fascinated by them right so that, that you become passionate about them and that passion only grows more and more with the more you know about them and the, the more complex the situation becomes the more various intricacies with other species start to play a part of it. So it's not just a single species, it becomes an, eco, an ecosystem approach. And for me, yeah, learning about those animals was, was, was very important. You know, I, I wanted to learn how big certain fish grew. I, I wanted to learn where they lived. And that's never changed. You know, now it, it allows me to go and explore areas where I know I've got a better chance of encountering them. And one of my, my earliest books that I actually bought was one of Dave's books. So I'm giving Dave's age away here. But um, there was a, a book on sharks, A Guide to Sharks of Southern Africa by, by Dave and, and another two very well-known scientists, Malcolm Smale and Dr. Leonard Compagna or Dr. Malcolm Smale. And um, that, that book was very important to me, you know, learning how big various species of sharks got, um, looking at all the different shapes and colors, you know, suddenly you, you realize it, it wasn't just a great white shark or, or a whale shark or a thresher shark. You had all these crazy different species of sharks out there. And every time you went into the ocean, it was kind of like a kid opening up a box of crayons. What was I going to find? And if I look in the kelp forest, I'm going to see these little endemic guys. And if I go into the open ocean, I might see a mako shark. So, yeah, just really, you know, reading up and um, learning what, you know, a lot of the academics had spent many years putting together for me was was one way I learned a lot about the different animals I, I was to encounter. And then I think probably the biggest, um, for me, uh, advice and amount of information I got that really helped me really learn about the ecosystems that I was working in was actually, believe it or not, from fishermen. And um, I, I started when I was 17 years old. I was still at school. I was supposed to be at school. I was actually spending more time away from school at the beaches and, and at sea than I, I was behind the books. But I started a project with um, local fishermen at a close by beach called Musenberg. And at the time, these guys were rowing, rowing their little boat out and they put a semicircular net around a shoal of fish and then they pull it to shore from, from both ends. And often they were catching sharks. And at the time they were killing them all because the local beach goers were saying these sharks are going to eat people, which they weren't. And I convinced them to allow me to start tagging these sharks and releasing them from their nets. And, you know, for the next 20 odd years, I worked with these guys and these guys really, you know, came from nothing. They were dirt poor. They had no education, but they were incredibly giving individuals in that they gave of their time. They gave of their knowledge. They really understood the ecosystem. They could tell me, well, you see when that little cloud sits on the mountain over there, it means the southeast is going to blow later. And when the southeaster blows at this time of the year, it means we're going to get a whole lot of churned up water in that part of the beach and that attracts this species of fish, which in turn will attract that shark. And so much in the same way as when you're in the bush, you learn to read the footprints. Basically, you're tracking animals and you learn which animals feed on which plants and how the ecosystem works. So these guys essentially were teaching me how to read the ocean. And that was a, a, a tremendous godsend for me in, in, in that it gave me an unbelievable practical knowledge of how, when and where to find certain species of sharks. I also was giving, getting hands-on experience in handling these animals and 
you know, over the next 20 years, we released more than 5,000 different sharks and rays from those nets that otherwise would have been killed, thanks to these guys allowing me to do that. And, you know, we, we got a huge amount of data out of that um, that was made available to various people working on projects and most importantly, helping conserve the sharks. So it was a, a fantastic e experience for me. It was really a good example of how um, without an academic path or qualification, you can still involve yourself and, and get an incredible amount of hands-on knowledge. And I always say that my greatest textbook in my life wasn't one that I held in my hands. It was the ones that I saw through my eyes, you know, being out there in the field for hundreds of days every year and learning and watching and seeing what the animals actually did. Well, that, that's a, a huge education in itself. Well, if I can add just I, I, w I was a young grad student when I did the book, so just to clarify, <laughs> uh, at the time, and um, I just I, to to try to just to add on or to support what Chris was just saying because when I was a grad student there in South Africa, it was going to these small little villages, towns, these beaches, just like Chris described, and I know exactly what he's talking about. These guys would put these nets out on Musenberg Beach and other places, and it was just talking to the guys. And these guys are just a wealth of knowledge. And one of the things that, that came out of that was they would try to describe different sharks to me. And they, they knew what they were talking about, but I didn't, without seeing it, I couldn't really relate to it. So that was kind of a bit of the impetus why we did the book in the first place was for the fishermen that were going out there every day. It was kind of a tool to help them to identify it that they could then convey to us or to myself what, what they were seeing. And that was that was tremendous, and it was so. It was geared for it was geared for these the fishermen, the people you're talking about, Chris. And um, I think that's something that's lost. We've talked about this in other episodes, Andrew. Is that a lot of times people overlook like the fishermen? They're the guys to talk to because you can learn to read the wildlife. You know what you know what sharks are going to be where or what fish are going to be where. So I just yeah, I think that's that's tremendous tremendous experience that you got onto that so early. Yeah, and I, I would I would add to that too. I think. A, a lot of people not just overlook the fisher the, the the fishing community, but also vilify the fishing community in a lot of instances where, you know, when you think about the fishing industry, you know, when people talk about fishing, they talk about overfishing. You know, it almost makes uh, you know fishermen uh, sort of the, um, you know, the villain in a lot of this. But they can be the best partners for conservation and and for fish. And, and a lot of the times that gets that doesn't get out there in sort of mainstream media. We start to hear that through stories such as, as Dave's and, and, and yours, Chris's, and, and being able to say, hey, these guys have actually been really great. You know, not only have they given us a, a lot of knowledge, but they've been part of these, you know, these, these tagging programs or helped us create these tagging programs. And Chris, I have to ask, you know, the, the, the release and, and tagging of these, of these sharks and rays, just, it's, it's wonderful. It's, it's fantastic. How did that program begin were you already in touch with some of uh you know these other research organizations that deal with sharks in south africa or is this was sort of your brainchild and you went to somebody and said hey i would like to start this program because it's really difficult to start a program you know just on someone's own uh without having partners i mean tags can be expensive and just the knowledge of tagging how did you uh how did that program begin i'd love to hear that story yeah, so at the time and still today, there's an organization in KwaZulu-Natal, so on the northeast coast of South Africa, uh, called the Oce Oceanographic Research Institute. And they had started a tagging program where they got uh, recreational anglers to start tagging fish on their behalf and submitting the tag information to them that they then collated and put into large databases and were able to write various papers and also used for various management decisions at the time with regards to certain fish species in South Africa. So it was a reasonably widely known program at the time, and I got hold of them. And I think in those days you paid a few bob to get a tagging kit, and you got a couple of instructions, and off you go. And that is essentially how I, I got involved um, with the tagging side of things. And, uh, yeah, you know, it was it was incredible, you know, to, to be able to go and take these huge sharks out of the nets and you – you, you, you're holding on to, a, you know, a two and a half, 2.8 meter, what is that, an eight, nine foot bronze whaler shark or a big sand tiger. And you take this animal out of the nets that would have died. Then you measure it and you've got 
dozens and dozens of people watching all of this happening and they're used to seeing these animals being killed and then suddenly you letting them help you take this animal and put it back in the water it was an incredible experience because not only were you contributing towards science and the local knowledge but more importantly you were educating them in a hands-on way where you took them from being um, essentially having this indoctrination of sharks kill to now hang on we've just helped this amazing animal and i don't want to see it die so you know over the years i think we we i went to probably close on 800 different nettings and you'd have sometimes a thousand people at some of these 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 nettings and yeah it was it was an an amazing educational tool and to this day you know i still this is now jeepers nearly 40 years 35 years later I still walk on Musenberg Beach many days and I still have, you know, people coming up to me, complete strangers and say, hey, I, do you remember when we put that shark or that big ray back? And it, it made a huge impact on people. And, you know, I don't think you can ever lose sight of the fact that if you help one animal, you've made a difference to that animal. And, you know, you don't always have to save the world. You can start in your own back garden. I think that's really important. And I, and I got to add that, you know, Going back 30, 35 years ago, I know when I was there, it was pretty typical, as Chris just explained, about when they'd catch a shark, they would just kill the shark and just leave it on the beach or, or dump it. Whereas as there's been this whole sea change, there were now it's very common for them to tag and release sharks. It's pretty unusual for them to actually keep them unless they're going to eat them. And, and would, Chris, would you think with the tagging program had a lot to do with that, and uh, changing people's attitudes? Yeah, Dave, I think, look, it certainly played a part, you know. I think... Um... I think documentaries, um, especially natural history ones, have, have played a part in that. Um, ironically, it's it's very much a double-edged sword for me. Um, recreational fishing for sharks, um, I think that played a part in it as well. Because um, as with hunters, and I'm not a hunter, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm I'm firmly against not killing animals for trophies. But you know, a lot of hunters are also people that. Um, have got a tremendous fascination and, and love of wildlife. And with the, re, with the recreational fishermen, you know, who were catching sharks, it was the same thing, that instead of killing them, they started catching them. And when they started catching them and handling them and releasing them, they developed a love for them and they didn't want to see them being killed. And then that became very popular in South Africa through mainstream um, TV programs, uh, you know, that became really big in this country where you saw guys going and fishing for sharks and releasing them. So... People suddenly were seeing on TV, you know, it's we don't kill these things anymore. We, we let them go. And I think over time, what also happened is instead of just going out and catching this thing and gaffing it and pulling it on the rocks and handling it in a rough way and taking a really lousy measurement, people started refining that and they started handling these animals a lot better. So that changed over time. So it, it, everything with conservation, as with photography, is an evolution. You don't find your style the first time you go out there. And I think, you know, it certainly has changed. Um, whether it's changed enough, I don't necessarily think so. You know, I think there are huge pressures facing sharks today just by the volume of people that there are on this planet. But I think the general perception towards these animals um, ha has certainly changed considerably in the last 30 years, undoubtedly, you know. And, um, yeah, hopefully it continues to do so. You know, it's, it's always a battle. It's kind of like the wave of negativity towards sharks kind of fights off against those who are trying to help it and at the end of the day you you hope that the tide of change outweighs that of of, of oppression and killing um yeah but we we always fight we're always fighting the the darkness of the killing of sharks so we carry on sure well you know there was uh and again i have mentioned this on other shows but you know south africa was the first country in the world to protect white sharks and you know, people today, and that was 30, 31, 32 years ago. And like people today, they, they sort of think like, oh, we're going to protect this species, that species. It's almost like a passive thing. Whereas at the time, it was so revolutionary. And, uh, at the, and I was still, I was actually still there in South Africa and was involved in that early stages. And it was just such a huge change. And I think, did you think that had helped help Chris as far as like some of the other people changing people's attitudes towards sharks when they when they protected white sharks in South Africa? Yeah, you know, Dave, that's a really interesting question. I've never kind of thought of that before, but I do think it, it, it had an impact because it firstly it made them high profile animals. 
um, and more high profile than they were. And, and, it, and, it, and it, it was a different profile, right? Because at that stage, we had no sharks that were being protected as far as I can remember. So suddenly the paradigm shift was there in, in that, well, if we're protecting it, that it must be in danger. So people suddenly, the penny dropped that, hey, hang on, sharks can be in danger. So I think, I think, I think in probably in, in that way, it had a significant impact, you know. Um, and it was, as you say, the first country in the world to protect great white sharks in 1991. And, um, you know, I think a lot of South Africans were very proud of it. I mean, we all used to drive around with stickers on the back of our cars that said protect the great white. And it was actually the, the, the diagram, that, well, the sketch that was used was from your book. I still remember it. And, um, yeah, you know, everybody had those, those stickers back then. And it, I think it, it, it created a, a, a mindset shift. Yeah, those, those stickers were made up by Leonard Campagno, who was my advisor at the time. And he, uh, and we put, and we started, these things just started going out. Everybody's putting them on their cars and their trucks and their vehicles. And I remember coming home from South Africa and putting one, having one on one of my vehicles. I gave them out to friends and people, you get the funniest looks like, uh, protect the white shark. What for? And this is getting back in like, you know, <laughs> yeah. the, the early nineties, but the, to give you an idea how much it changed, but yeah, you, what you say in South Africa was the same thing. It was like, what, what do you, people, it just, their whole mindset just shook things up. Like, what do you mean they protect white sharks? You know, cause they were just always considered the killer. So yeah. it was just, yeah. I was glad you remember that. I forgot, I forgot about those stickers and stuff. They're really, they're so, you know, <laughs> well, do, do they yeah, I, I, I had a couple. Go ahead. No, they don't. I, th I think if you got them going again, you'd probably get even more of a buy-in now because obviously oh, yeah. I'm sure we'll get onto that. The white, the white sharks are really not in a good way here now. So they, they, mm -hmm. they really need, you know, I think we need a lot more stickers out there. Absolutely. <laughs> now, you oh, know, yeah. one thing that's been, that's been really interesting uh, to see in South Africa, especially is the uh, amazing documentation of the great white population over you know, the last 30, 40 years. A lot of that is because of you in terms of your photography. And, and, and you know, we see it in science where people are taking photos of whether it be sharks. Some, a lot of times you see it in marine mammals. Uh, you see it now in whale sharks. And you're able to identify through algorithms, you know, individuals. Um, and from my research is a lot of the times, and, and I think and I think it's, uh, I please correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Chris, you were mentioning another interview that you did um, that there, like you have the large, like South Africa has the largest database of sort of like an indiv of individual sightings of great whites. Is that is that true? Um, well, I, yeah, I don't know about the individual sightings. What we certainly have the largest database of where we worked was of of natural predatory events. So with our work at Seal Island in False Bay, from the very first day I went out there in 1996 till the present. Um, and sadly, when the White Sharks left there in, in 2018, we kept data on every single day. So we, we had a database of more than 10,400 predatory events, which cumulatively was more, many times more than the rest of the world put together. And that was just from one location. But, um, you know, f fin IDs have been quite commonplace for a long time as a passive way of getting to know, you know, the identity of a local population. And a very non-invasive way of seeing, you know, what ties they have between other adjacent areas. So that was a, a very popular way of, of photographing and, and getting to know individuals within a population between different localities and, and being able to compare them and, and do a very rough sort of popula population dynamic study. Um, you know, that, that people that weren't necessarily scientifically or academically qualified could certainly get involved with and help because... You know, a good photo, if it's taken by somebody who's never been to school or somebody that's got a doctorate at the end of the day, does exactly the same thing. So, you know, I think that was certainly a, a way that your your average citizen scientist could get involved. And, you know, I think also it was very interesting. We learned a lot of things from those photo IDs in so much as, you know, the, the fins didn't stay looking the same as they, they started out in life. And you kind of, the fin is a is almost a, a fingerprint of the animal's life. You know, it carries injuries, it accumulates them, much like we do battle wounds through our life. They, ha they have a certain parasite load on them. And it, it was very interesting watching how those fins developed their own character over the years as well. So a very large part of what we did with, with our company 
at, at Seal Island in False Bay was um, non-invasive studies. I used to tag sharks a lot, but over time, my own opinion became that, you know, if we're not doing a huge amount to conserve the animals through all the tagging we're doing, um, let's not put extra pressure on them because those tags often get overgrown. They, they cause deformities. There, there are all sorts of reasons why I stopped tagging them eventually. None more so than, you know, was the juice worth, worth the squeeze at the end of the day? But the, the non-invasive stuff where you're just out there every day recording what's going on, you don't think it's important at the time. But if you record consistently a lot of data over time, it really builds up unbelievable patterns that if you'd asked me 30 years ago, I would have said, well, jeepers, I, I would never have thought that would reveal this or this would reveal that. And most importantly, time is so important when you're recording data, because if you do a study over one year or two years, it essentially reveals a snapshot of something's life. And if management decisions are based on that, it's, it's, it's extremely dangerous. You know, I wasn't the same person today as I was 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago. We change over life. And if you're keeping detailed data over a huge population, you can see those changes. You can see how those animals feed in different areas, how they do different things, how they inter interact with different individuals. And by keeping large databases purely of observational data, provided it's done consistently, um, it's, it's vitally important. And it certainly can contribute towards science, you know, in, a, in its own way. And um, I think, yeah, you know, it's very low impact for the animals as well. So it's win-win it's all around. Absolutely. And I think yeah. capturing a predatory event has got to be pretty exciting as well when you're, you know, when you're in there and you're, and you're watching these things happen. Uh, do you remember your first, you know, capture of a predatory event from, from a white shark? You know, I hate to say I don't. And, that, and that's really weird. I've never actually been asked that question before. And if you ask me my first predatory event I ever saw, um, no, I can't. Um, I can remember... I, I can remember, I could graphically tell you about, and when I say graphically, I don't mean the gory details, but I could graphically tell you about hundreds and I could easily go back to my data books and tell you exactly what that first one looked like. But um, natural predation for me was, was the greatest privilege I've ever had working with animals, watching those life and death struggles every day and developing a respect for both predator and prey. And as strange as it may seem from having seen nearly ten and a half thousand of them um i became softer over time not that i was ever <laughs> bloodthirsty by any stretch but you know I'd, i i just had an incredibly healthy respect for the fact that i was watching life and death in front of me and um that seal's life was as important as mine to that seal and that shark getting that meal was as important as me getting my next meal in fact a lot more important because I probably have a lot more meals than that shark did. So, um, yeah, it, it was a, it was an incredible and humbling privilege to have spent so much time um, watching how these animals fought for their survival, learning about those predatory behaviors, learning about the strength of the sharks and the strength of the seals. And incredibly, over all that time, the sharks had a 49.6% success rate. So, so call it, call it exactly 50%. And, you know, the sharks had the speed and they, they had the, the incredible, incredible power, whereas the sharks, the seals really had the uh, abil uh, agility and endurance. So you, you had this in beautiful balance that, that showed itself through, through all the seasons with very little variances. And that's one of the amazing things, you know, the way, whether you're working with terrestrial animals or you're working with marine animals, is that in nature, virtually always, there's a, there's a lovely balance. And that's why ecosystems work. You know, everything's kind of in tune with, with each other. I was going to Absolutely. add that it's really seed one of these uh, predation events, when, especially when it's like not, not staged, which you have. It's, it's, it's incredible compared to like sometimes they'll, you know, you see things that are staged or they'll show things on like some of these documentaries. But to see one of these things just a lot, just happen naturally it's it's just an incredible an incredible event it's it's very it's it you, you found a really unique area there in false bay where you're able to go out and you can kind of with some high degree of certainty you can you can determine what times of the year that you're likely to see these different predation events 
you go out to like uh, Seal Island? Yeah, absolutely. So Dave, you know, historically, and I, and I hate to use the past tense because um, sadly it doesn't happen anymore and we'll probably get onto that. But uh, it was usually in our winter months. So South African winter months are April through to August. You know, that's our late autumn or fall. And then we go to our early spring, which is around about September. And, you know, on one day in 2012, we recorded 46 predatory events, which was more than the second highest place in the world, the Farallon Islands, in an entire year. So, yeah, you know, seeing, seeing those predatory events was amazing. And, you know, sadly, um, I was always really pushing with the documentary crews to film more of it and, and take less of the human side of what was going on out there because really we're irrelevant in that picture. The sharks are so sensational and sexy. You don't need idiots like me or other people in these shows. And yeah, it was just a very difficult behavior to capture because like when I'm shooting it from a still photogra photographic point of view, you've got a subject in the sharks that is camouflaged. It's underwater. You don't know where this animal is. Then the prey moves irregularly on the surface and at one minute it's here, another second it's there and so it goes. Then you're on an unstable environment and you've got elements like salt spray and wind all competing against you. So it was very difficult and those natural predations, you know, last sometimes if it's one strike, it's one second. But if you're lucky, you know, the shark, lucky for us from a spectator point of view, if the shark missed in that initial strike, you could get these incredible dances where the one is trying to line up the other one and the seal's trying to get as close to the shark behind the mouth as it can so the shark can't line it up. And those battles could go on sometimes for three, four, five, even ten minutes. And there were some occasions where we saw four different sharks try to catch the same seal. So this tiny seal, young of the year, six, seven months of age, would evade one shark and... You, you need to think about that six to seven months of age and it's taking on the most formidable predator in the ocean and it has got the presence of mind to know not to race to get back to the island in a straight line because the shark's quicker than it but to get as close to its uh, the, the ultimate enemy as it possibly can so it would evade this one shark literally bouncing off its snout the shark would be, become fatigued disappear and then it would go and a hundred yards on another shark would go at it and it would manage to get away from that shark and so it would go and eventually 50 meters from the island a shark would take it out and you know these were the things that were very emotional to watch because you can't but have empathy and um, a sense of remorse almost to see an animal that has defied death you know, so in such an accomplished way, you know, falling short at the last hurdle, you know, and then there were those amazing encounters where, you know, you watch a seal literally balancing on the snout of a five meter or 15 foot great white and it gets away from that one, another one flicks it through the air and then literally just before the rocks, the great white has a go, go at it and then it climbs back up onto the island and it's like this, this, Incredible hallelujah, Olympic gold medalist, you know, feeling. You see, I think you described it well, Chris. You talked about this sort of dance between the predator and the prey. And and a lot of times I think people like, you know, when you do these shows, they, they put a lot of drama or music behind it. But if you just watch it, just what's going on, and you obviously have had a, a, a front row seat a lot of us to watch what's going on in both the predator and the prey. And you can, you're can you not watching like just little short clips of it. You're watching the entire event unfold. And it's 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 got to be just an amazing feel just to see that as you just described the sort of as a, I think the best way is just this dance between these things and how one's trying to survive the other one's actually they're both trying to survive one needs to eat to survive the other needs to get away to survive the predator stuff it's just it's it's just na raw nature really it's what it is and uh, it's just well it's, it's yeah uh, it, 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 the, the the amazing thing was that you know what you learn over time is that as the prey or as the predator you can make quite a few mistakes as the prey you can make only one mm. and or you can't make any actually and um you know that, that that was always something that's quite defining for me is that you have to be so on top of your game every time you go out to feed every time you come back if you think of a cave fur seal 
they live on an island at Seal Island, which is home to 65,000 of them. So they, they're always battling with their own kind. Then they have to leave the island, often through huge breaking surf on the southern terminus of the island. They have to get through this cauldron of, of death using incredibly sophisticated anti-predatory techniques that they had defined over time, peculiar to this island. They then have to swim sometimes upwards of a marathon or more to go find food in some of the most hostile seas in the world, in an environment where their food is becoming ever more scarce, often tr dodging the, the, the bullets of fishermen's guns who they're competing with. Then they have to come back and go through, once again, a few hundred yards from their home, they have to go through this most sophisticated cordon of great white sharks, and only then can they get back onto the island and have a good sleep and then have to do it all again a few days later. So, yeah, you know, unfortunately, that story was never properly told. And we did, you know, countless Air Jaws documentaries and, and many others that obviously were very, very popular. Flying Sharks, it's, how can they not be popular? But the true natural history story, that, you know, remains to, to be told and, um, hopefully in the book that we're going to have coming out, I, I will tell that story in the way that does these animals in that most unbelievable place justice because yeah, it was it was a location like no other. And, um, you know, I can only say I feel like the, the luckiest person on earth to have had the privilege of spending time with both those unbelievable sharks and those equally incredible seals. Absolutely. So I, I just so wanted to kind of go back to... Uh... You know, just to, the way you capture sort of these interactions. Um, obviously, you, you mentioned it before, just there's so many challenges, you know, being at sea, capturing the right moment. You almost have to be a bit predictable in terms of learning the behavior right before a predatory event to be able to capture this. But it also takes uh, a lot of time and patience to be out there. Um, and, you know, catching over 10,000 events, um, you know, this kind of speaks to more of your your career aspect of, you uh, know, and a lot of people I'm sure that are hearing this, you know, we have a lot of scientists who, who listen to this or a lot of conservationists listen to this who use photography as a hobby or even videography as a hobby because it's really difficult to uh you know, have a career in this in this area and to be exposed to these yeah. types of behaviors uh, and just having the time to be exposed to this. How did you progress sort of over your career to be able to um, afford that time and, and be able to, to make a living through that? Was it all through photography and selling those photos? Um, did you have any other type of businesses as you go around? Because Dave and I have talked about in terms of how we survive, you know, doing a lot of ocean research and, and stuff and going back and forth to starting businesses and, and, and this and that. Uh, how did How did your uh, you know, especially the early parts of your career kind of progressed through that that evolution. So when I started working with those trek fishermen, the guys with the beach sand nets, in 1991, we caught a little great white shark in those nets. And it was still the smallest great white shark I've, I've ever seen. It was 1.58 meters in length. So what's that, six, six feet or so, a real tiny little thing. And um, I still remember I went into the nets and I manhandled, I carried a little great white shark like this out and I tagged the shark and I, I took the, the tagging data to the only group that were working with white sharks in South Africa at the time. And um, they, it was, they were called the White Shark Research Institute and they were actually headed up by a very famous great white shark hunter who had turned green. And um, they offered, they could see, here was this crazy young guy who was super keen about sharks and they offered me a volunteer position with them. So I volunteered with them for four years, didn't get paid a, a, a cent. Um, I had a mother who very kindly still allowed me to stay at home. So I had a roof over my head. But I used to go and walk the local beaches at four o'clock in the morning to pick up a certain type of shell called a nautilus shell. And then I used to basically hitch a ride to another area to go collect fossilized shark teeth. And um, I eventually saved up enough money. Oh, sorry, I also used to illegally dive golf balls out from the local golf club when they hit them in the hole, and I used to sell those. And um, I built up enough money to buy my, my own share of a little inflatable boat. It was only around about just under 12 foot long. 
And having worked with the, the White Shark Research Institute at a place called Dyer Island of Hans by a very famous White Shark location, um, I, I learned a lot about the White Sharks from Theo and Craig Ferreira and others at the time. I had amazing exposure to these animals. And in 1993, we worked on a show uh, called uh, BBC Wildlife on One with David Attenborough. It was called Great White Shark, still one of the most beautiful shark shows ever made. And in that show, there was a chap by the name of um, Scott Anderson at the Farallon Islands. And he was casting a surfboard off the rocks and winding it in. And a shark came and lunged it on the surface. And that gave me an idea to make a seal-shaped uh, decoy, essentially, and put it in the water and see what happened. And it, it haunts by, funny enough, we never towed the thing. We put it in the water and the shark showed quite a lot of interest in it. But I thought, well, let me go try at Seal Island. And Seal Island is about, uh, let's see, if you know where Cape Town is, it's about half an hour from Cape Town. So it's a lot closer to where I stayed. And I'd asked a lot of people if there are great whites there. And they said, well, they don't see them there. They see them inshore. But what we had learned from Hansby and in Dyer Island was that the white sharks were predominantly at the seal colonies in winter. And no one had ever gone to Seal Island in False Bay in winter. So I managed to convince a, a, a couple of friends who were pretty gullible at the time to come out in the rubber boat with me. And we illegally launched. I did a lot of illegal things when I was young. But we, we illegally launched off one of Cape Town's beaches. And uh, we went out to Seal Island. And I put a little yellow life jacket, roughly the size of a seal, behind the life jacket. And we started towing it. And I didn't really expect anything to happen. And literally 30 seconds after we put it in the water, a really small great white, also, you know, only probably around about just over two meters in length, which was very rare for Seal Island, we'd learn in later years, came flying out the water. And we looked at this and we couldn't believe what we had seen. And the shark spat the decoy out. And I, I went up to it and got it again and tied it on. And two of the guys, there were four of us on board, they were like adamant we're going home. Another, another mate of mine, Robert, he was with me and he said, no, well, we can stay. So it was two against two and I was holding the tiller of the boat. So we were staying and um, put this little life jacket out and we towed it for about half an hour and nothing. And then a proper great white. So the only time I could ever say the shark was bigger than the boat, um, around about 3.8 meters or so in length, so about 12 foot, came flying out the water, spat the decoy out, then started circling the rubber duck. And um, no amount of convincing could get my friends to stay there. So we headed back. But obviously the penny had dropped that not only were there great whites there, but flying great whites. And um, yeah, so it was, a, it was obviously a, mo a monumental discovery for us. And um, the big problem for us came about now, how do we keep this quiet? Because my friend and I, we had very little money. I just saved up enough to buy a rubber boat, for goodness sakes. And he was delivering pizzas at the time to make money. So we carried on trying to make a few beans and eventually we kept things quiet. We only took out friends that we, we essentially swore to secrecy. Otherwise, we'd feed them to the sharks, right? And um, we, we eventually saved up enough money to buy a, a, a fiberglass boat, so a proper boat that was about 20 foot in length. And then we started taking out local or, or foreign tourists who were locally in the area and once again telling them, to not tell anybody, because if local people had boats and, you know, tourism operators find out, we would have been crushed and you would have had a circus developing there. And we used to go to such lengths as we would actually cover our, we had, eventually we had a ramshackle cage made that would, would not pass any health and safety regulations. And uh, we, used to, we used to cover the cage with tarpaulin. And anybody who looked under the cage, we used to tell them that was a giant lobster trap. And we, we came up with all sorts of BS to, to get our way around. But anyhow, one of the guests um, shot some video footage of this. And they were probably really excited when they got back to the States. And it got leaked to National Geographic. And at the time, Peter Benchley, as you know, the famous author of Jaws, uh, they were working on, a, on a, a movie celebrating Jaws. I think it was... This was 1999, so probably probably would have been uh, for the 25th anniversary or something like that of Jaws. And um, together with David Dubelay, who was one of the most famous underwater photographers, Rodney Fox, the most famous shark attack victim, Rocky Strong, who, who Dave will remember, who was a very famous shark scientist at the time. They were all part of this crew, so they came out. And I, I still remember Peter Benchley writing that... Um, 
Two young boys with a very rich imagination had lured him to Seal Island, and he couldn't believe that such things could happen. And we took them out, and, and sure enough, these things did happen. Sharks did fly there, and that really you know, put Seal Island on the map, so to speak. And from then onwards, it was a flood of people wanting to come and see. And the phone literally rang off the hook with all the biggest documentary crews in the world. So we realized that there was potentially, you know, business and ecotourism. So that's essentially how I started making a career. And about the same time, I, you know, I started um, having photographs published of this unique behavior. And Yes, you know, what can I say? I was the right place at the right time. I was a lucky guy to discover what we did. And um, yeah, everybody wanted those photographs and all the papers around the world. So that catapulted my photographic career, whereas it would have been a lot slower hadn't I been so fortunate. And then, um, yeah, the, the photographic career kind of grew in tandem with the, the ecotourism. And you know, in the early 2000s, shark, shark, great white shark tourism, because of the documentary, suddenly started booming. And, you know, to give you an idea, at around about, in, just before COVID in 2019, around about late, late 18, 19, more than 120,000 people were coming to South Africa for the primary purpose of seeing great white sharks. So it, it really morphed into something quite incredible. And, um, yeah, I think the flying great whites played a large part in that, as did many other amazing, you know, South Africans that were pioneers, you know, Andre Hartman, Mark Marx, Michael Rudson, Craig Ferreira, you know, all these guys, and I'm probably forgetting a couple, but all these guys, you know, really, really play, played their part in one or other way. First guy I knew that did this, uh, do you remember a guy named Peter Vandervall? He was the first guy that I remember. Yeah, PJ. About. Yeah, about 1989, 90, he was going out there to That's right. with the white sharks, and he was trying to get him, but he couldn't get him to come in consistently. And I hope people don't. I'll, this, and he basically, so he's, we were talking with him about like, how can he get these sharks to come in consistently? And well, I was at the South African Museum at the time, and they had a lot of, you know, we, they had a marine mammal center there, and they used to do necropsies on dolphins and seals. And I said like. Walked down. I said, "Well, you know, I bet you some of these dolphins, the oil would probably attract them." He said, "Well, great, I'll try it." <laughs> and so he took it out to Seal Island, and he was back the next day. He goes, "Can I get yep. some more?" He goes, "Like I barely put the stuff in the water, and I had like three sharks circling the boat." And then he was, but he was the first yeah. guy that I knew started that whole thing going out, going out to Seal Island to to kind of see these things. And that I, you couldn't do that today. Go get some, you know, dolphin carcasses that these. These were stuff that were being done for science. They were just going to be thrown at, uh, taken out to the dump and stuff. So he just started borrowing the stuff. Yeah. He borrowed it. It was a one-way trip. He'd take it out there. But that that oil from those dolphins just brought those sharks in like like it was like magnets. Yeah, came right gone. in there. And so he was the first guy I remember that, that started going out and doing that. And that was like 1989, 1990. And then it starts you, then you and I, other, right. you know, other people started coming on board. To go out to go out and do some of that do some of that stuff and one thing i wanted to add is just so people understand like seal island it's just right off a place called musenberg beach which is like one of the most popular beaches around false bay chris isn't it and like so it's not like you're going anywhere yeah. really remote it's it's right there you can look at it from the beach yeah so seal island lies about 10 kilometers uh where is that southeast of of um musenberg and uh, Musenberg is one of South Africa's most popular learn to surf beaches. And, you know, yeah, um, when PJ, it was actually PJ and a chap called Mike Boone, they went out into False Bay to, they actually, yeah, they actually found them at Macassar. He, he had tried at Seal Island. They didn't have any luck there. They found him down in Macassar. Um, but, uh, you know, in those, in those days, that's kind of what people did. And even in the early 90s, 1991, when we started working with them, the, the Department of Sea Fisheries at the time, when they were doing necropsies, they, they had, as you know, they had these ginormous freezers with, like, come and get your favorite shark bait. And they used to have, like, leftover whales and, and dolphins and turtles. And the only thing they didn't have in there were, you know, Alsatians and Maltese poodles. And, um, yeah, it, it, was, it was quite incredible, you know, things that are frowned on nowadays and, and uh, quite rightly so, you know, at the end of the day, that's what sharks fed on. So in those early years, we, 
I remember once there was a, a huge leatherback turtle. The thing must have weighed like a thousand pounds. I mean, it was ginormous. And it had been hit by a, a boat, and funny enough, in Table Bay Harbor. And we, we took this thing and we, we, we froze it because we couldn't use it straight away. And we, the day came for us to use it, but now this whole thing was frozen. It took three days to, to thaw this thing. And eventually we, we managed to hack off like the giant side flippers and big chunks and we took it out to Dire Island. You think those sharks would touch it? They wouldn't touch that damn thing for all the money in the world. So you, you, you learned like all the things that worked. And one of them, as you said, you know, marine mammals, nothing attracts a great white shark like, like a piece of whale blubber or dolphin. And, and sadly, the other thing that, you know, the guys learned very early on and I, I really, you know, wasn't very fond of it all was um, shark livers. You know, great white sharks feed on small sharks as, a, as an important part of their diet for a lot of their life. So a lot of the shark hunters and, and guys at the time were using small live sharks to catch them. And um, people also learned that the shark livers were incredibly good. So in the early days, the, the industry used a lot of that. You know, some of us refused to point blank. But it put a lot of pressure on certain species of sharks. So, you know, certainly further up the coast from where we were, um, excuse me, seven gill sharks were were being killed for their shark livers to, to satisfy the industry. That stopped quite quickly. But um, yeah, it was a it was also you know, it was the wild west out there in those days, man. <laughs> it was it was crazy stuff and, and yeah, no, I say I know those guys like uh, Mike Myers and Herman Oshazen and those guys over at Fishery. They, they used to spend a lot of time going over and doing necropsies on white sharks. That sometimes they just wash up on the, on the beaches just for different for what who knows what reason, and they would haul them over there and go over to do those necropsies. And uh, yeah, what you're saying about other sharks and the livers. Yeah, I remember guys using some of those different things to to lure in to catch those catch those sharks out there. I, I want to ask you, Chris, you know, you've talked about how there you had some peak years where there's like a no shortage of white sharks around the Western Cape and in False Bay. And can you tell us a little bit what's been going on recently? Because I know that the population seems to have gone down. Do you have any ideas as to what's happening? Yeah, look, I mean, we've all got our own de ideas and we've all got our own opinions. And there's unfortunately, there's a lot of conjecture about it that really clouds the issue. Um, they're, they're too strong. Well, let's, let me go back a little bit. Around about 2012, 2013, we started seeing a, a decline in the numbers of great whites at Seal Island. And remember, I, I kept data from day one, and we also kept data not only, only on predation, but on every single great white shark that we saw come to our boat. So we had accurate numbers on how many animals we'd see on a daily basis over the years. And, and yeah, so in the early 2000 teens, we started seeing a decline, and then around about... 2014, the, the decline was steep, and tragically, by 2018, there were no longer any great white sharks at Seal Island in False Bay. And what we learned from the very earliest of days, because I was making a living out of working with these animals, so you wanted to find know where they were to find them to take tourists to see them. So we learned when they went to Seal Island, which essentially was for seven to eight months of the year, we learned that they were inshore. And the inshore areas where we found them correlated 100% with where there were high numbers of these smaller sharks called smooth hound sharks, and then another species of shark uh, called siphon sharks. So we knew that those were the areas that we, we, where we would find them. And uh, unfortunately, the numbers of those small sharks really started to plummet uh, just before we noticed a, a massive decline in the white sharks. And... There was a, a fishery that was really starting to get traction at about that time called the Demersal Shark Longline Fishery that was very heavily fishing these sharks. Uh, they developed a, a very good market to export them to Australia for what they call flake, but it's fish and chips. And um, <clears throat> there were a couple of boats in particular that had really managed to figure out exactly where these small sharks could be found, where and when. So the populations in False Bay and Surrounds were, were targeted first because the boats were initially based out of uh, Hout Bay Harbour, Cork Bay and, and other areas. And then as they wiped out the small sharks from False Bay, so they started fishing on the Cape South Coast very successfully. So when we noticed that those small sharks disappeared, two things happened. First, we couldn't find the white sharks in those areas where the small sharks used to be anymore. 
And secondly, the white shark started coming to Seal Island earlier in those first few years when we started noticing the drop off. And instead of being there at the time when the young seals were really going out to feed for, their, for themselves and it was the optimal time for them to hunt, they were coming there prior to that time. And what they were doing is they were essentially scavenging on the northern side of the island, waiting for sick, dead or dying seals to come out. And we couldn't figure out why, why there had been this change. But over time, what I think was potentially happening, and it is my own hypothesis, is that they were supplementing the shortfall of the smaller sharks inshore with another food source that they were trying to kind of make a go of it, you know, feed on these dead, sick and dying seals. And then there are still some of these smaller sharks left. So combined, there was possibly enough. So we started seeing a decline of, of the great whites from as early as 2012, 2013. The other school of thought that is very popular in South Africa is that two orcas uh, known as port and starboard, and they're known as port and starboard because their dorsal fins collapse. One goes to the left and the other goes to the right appeared on the scene around about 2015. There was a sighting in False Bay, one sighting in False Bay 2015. The next sighting was in False Bay was, was 2017. So I personally do not believe that the orcas in False Bay played any part in the major decline in these animals because you cannot blame something that wasn't there when the decline was already happening. And, and also these orcas come into our area they came into the area once, an entire population of great whites that's been there for decades in a preferred feeding area is not going to be pushed away forever by infrequent visits. But in 2017, these two orcas were implicated in killing at least five white sharks in, in Hansbach. And what certainly does happen, and we know this from the Farallon Islands, we know it from Australia, we know it from New Zealand when orcas predate on white sharks, is that the white sharks will move as an entire population for short to medium term. They'll leave an area and then they'll come back to an area. And we saw that initially in Khan's Bay and we've seen it also in Mossel Bay and other areas. But it does not explain now the complete absence of great whites in False Bay. The complete or almost they have one or two sightings every few months in Khan's Bay where they'd have 20 animals a day before. The almost complete absence in Khanspai and the, the major decline further along our coastline. So, yeah, by 2018, the great whites were gone from False Bay completely. And it was after that that the orca number, or the, we started seeing port and starboard more frequently. And I'd actually been keeping data because I keep data not just on great whites, but I keep data on anything interesting we see in the bay. And we had had no less than nine different, nine different pods of orcas in False Bay before port and starboard. They were dolphin specialists. We used to often see them close to Seal Island. In fact, I've got many photographs of the orcas knocking dolphins into the air and great white sharks with the same backgrounds killing seals, also flying through the air. And often we'd sit at Seal Island and see the one, and just in the distance we'd see the orcas chase, chasing the dolphins. And we... I recorded data on 43 different events where the two were, were within about five miles of each other and there was virtually no decline or change in behavior of the white sharks over those times. So I very strongly believe that yes, orcas do play a part and it's short and medium term as has happened in the Farallons, Australia and New Zealand, but I certainly don't believe that two orcas are going to displace an entire population from preferred feeding areas over such a huge stretch of coastline. And, you know, if you look at it from a terrestrial equivalent, and I spend a huge amount of time in the bush as well with my photography, when a pride of lions comes into an area, for example, yes, it will displace the wild dogs and the cheetah and the smaller predators, but those animals cannot afford to give up a favorable feeding environment forever. So as those lions move through the area, those other animals work around them, and you have predatory shifts related to apex predators, but you do not simply give up an area. So my firm belief, and it is only my opinion, is that the smaller prey species are vital to the sharks and the, the predator goes where the prey goes. And then I think that the South African white shark population is not nearly as robust as people thought. There have been genetic studies that have shown that it's, it's a relatively small genetic population. And then I think there's still massive pressures facing these animals. You know, the Natal Sharks Board, which kills between 11 and 60 great white sharks a year. It's the world's largest government sanctioned great white killing machine on the planet is still out there. We have poaching. 
we have bycatch, we have death due to recreation, illegal recreational fishing. You have these animals being essentially stripped of one of their main food sources, and then you have the added pressure of orcas. I simply don't think South Africa's great white shark population is robust enough to handle all these things. So those, that's my humble opinion, and there are many that will disagree, and um, yeah, that's the way it is. It's interesting. I mean, I, I know from talking with people that are up on the KZN, KwaZulu-Natal coast there, uh, in the last couple of years have commented that they see more white sharks up that way than they've seen in the past. And a few people have speculated that maybe the population, as you suggest, has been displaced, and maybe it's more common up on the on the east coast now perhaps maybe they've moved further up on the west coast do you think have you, have you heard any have you heard anything along those lines at all about the populations that are actually just shifting yeah dave so there's a there's a school of thought that says the population has shifted eastward mm-hmm. and it's generally the school of short that's shared by um government scientists and management mm-hmm. and they kind of say okay well the, the white shark population hasn't crashed it's gone somewhere else but that's simply not true so if you look at the eastward shift, once you leave Khanspar, your next big major great white shark aggregation, aggregation site is Mossel Bay. Mm-hmm. And I work very closely with the lead scientist there, Dr. Enrico Gennari, and their data now is showing a, a slow to medium-sized decline. Mm-hmm. Then uh, for the last two years with Professor Neil Hammerschlag, we've done a study based at Roburg, which is the next white shark hotspot. And that study has been looking at population numbers based cliff cliff observation where they look down into the water and they count the sharks that are coming there and there's there's no increase in numbers of sharks there then when we go east the next port of call is port elizabeth and port elizabeth has had basically very scant data collection and irregular data collection at a place called bird island over time i mean yes there have been studies being done there but it it hasn't been very continuous, sustained, and, and done on a daily basis. And the, the now the commercial operator that's working there, a chap by the name of Lloyd Edwards, he's been keeping data for the last three years, and he is not seeing an increase in numbers. In fact, they see very few individual white sharks, and they see the same animals time and time again. What they are noticing in Port Elizabeth, and, and I think this is where the confusion comes in, is that the local recreational anglers who actually in many cases illegally targeting these animals and their number the, the the anglers numbers have increased over time and they've become more efficient at catching them they're catching more than they historically were but there's no data there's no consistent database because these guys weren't fishing for them in the way they are 20 25 even 15 10 years ago and then if we go even further east to the natal sharks board and that, I think, is a pretty consistent way of ascertaining what the population numbers are over time because the effort is, is rel- relatively consistent. They're catching less great whites than ever before. So I, I do not see where the eastern shift is at all. Yeah. that at this point anyway. Right. Yeah. No, and the West, the West Coast has always – the West Coast has always had scant records of great white sharks in South Africa. Um, they were traditionally transitory animals. They used to be irregularly seen in Table Bay. There were, in fact, famous shark attacks in 1942. There was a fatal shark attack at Clifton Beach, which is one of South Africa's glamorous beaches. In 1974, no, 1976, there was another famous attack on a guy called Jeffrey Spence, who ironically at the time was reenacting the jaw scene, believe it or not. And he got he got bitten. So there, there was there were records certainly over time from from Table Bay and the West Coast, but but never regular numbers. Nowadays, you simply do not hear of these animals on the West Coast. Period. And to take this this whole discussion a bit further, the False Bay population was comprised primarily of of sub adult sharks and about fifteen percent of adult sharks, which was by a long way, the largest average size of white sharks in South Africa. Mossel Bay's population is usually uh, small to teenage sharks. Hans Bay was typically teenage sharks with a few sub-adults thrown in. And that population from False Bay that we monitored very closely, and I used to tag them in the early days, there was very little overlap with Hans Bay. So it was almost like a distinctive population of these big animals that didn't really go to too many other places. And 
subsequent to their disappearance from False Bay, these really massive great whites have just not shown up anywhere. So if you had to ask me what's happened to them, I can't tell you. I don't know the answer. I, I really hope, in my heart of hearts, to be so wrong about it. I would, be, I would love nothing more than to be wrong about this and that these great whites come back and it was just due to a huge climatic shift and changing bodies of water and they found a happy sharky place somewhere else where there's lots of food. But, yeah, I, I guess maybe I've become a bit jaded and skeptical over time. Uh, yeah, let's, let, let, let's see what happens. Obviously, yeah. it's, it's understandable. I mean, you've been watching these... Uh, you know these these great whites your your entire career uh you know you created a business based off of it uh you know a lot of your a lot of your photography creations have been have been from that um and it's it's really interesting to see the big change all of a sudden and and what what's interesting to me as somebody like you know i have a a, another podcast that that deals with ocean news and, and so forth and the only news that i that i see um, from other media outlets is the the orca problem, you know, and and that's that seems to be the overall narrative that's come out. I've, I this is the first time actually when I was watching one of your other interviews uh, with with Gemma uh, was the first time that I heard of another problem uh, with with fisheries and and looking at sort of the the uh, shark species that you mentioned that was being that was being depleted from fishing and and for the fish and chips. And so it's uh, it's really interesting just to get that conversation out there and to get that information out there because that doesn't seem to be the narrative that's that's coming out of a lot of these media outlets because maybe it's not as sexy as hey orcas are are depleting the the great white population and and that that's a shame to be honest of that that being the narrative. I, I think you know it's just to add in Chris I mean because I'm right here in Monterey and like the Farallons are just up the coast here from me. I, I you know I get a few shifts that we've seen. I mean orcas are. Unlike the Western Cape, where orcas are not as common, the orcas are pretty common here at times of the year, and they're feeding on the gray whales. It's, and it's not uncommon with a few pods here. But the other thing we've had is a shift over the last sort of seven, eight years now, whereas the little young of the year white sharks, which used to be common, in, which are still common in Southern California and Northern Baja, they've taken up residency here in Monterey Bay, which is a huge shift for them. And again, we're kind of talking about you know, kind of going you know straight on a straight shot here versus South Africa being more of a, a uh, having a kind of a, a, a semicircle there. That the whole idea, your idea that the population may have shifted, there may be some validity to that because we've definitely seen it here in California. And as I say, we have like orcas are pretty common around here. And as you say, they'll come into the Farallon Islands and they'll not maybe knock off a white shark now and then, and then they'll move the sharks off a little bit, but they come back as soon as the orcas move away. And um, so I think there's, I think your ideas about maybe the population shifting, maybe some changing oceanographic conditions, the populations move to a sharkier area. Maybe it is something to do with their, with their main, some of their other main prey, the little sharks being uh, consumed. It'd be, it sounds like it'd be a terrific study. And it sounds like you've already been keeping a lot of notes just from your own experiences out there and what's going on. I just find somebody to follow up on that and see what, to really look at what's going on. Why, why the white sharks are in decline? Yeah, I mean, the, the, to be honest, to be honest, uh, Andrew, there's been a, a lot in the media about. We did three big stories on CNN. Uh, one was half an hour long. There's a really interesting website if you want to get that side of the story called um, it's www.sharkfreechips.com, and it's just got a, a lot of hard hitting facts um, that I think you know if people became more aware of that they would find very interesting. At the end of the day, you know, the reality is that for government scientists and government fisheries managers, you you can't manage two orcas. It's a natural phenomenon. Um, you can manage small shark populations and overfishing of them. And it's, it's quite easy to blame two orcas if you just mm -hmm. want the problem to go away. So, you know, I'll, I'll let people make of that what they like. But um, the, the reality is that all the areas that I've been to in the world where I've dived with white sharks, um, you know, pretty much bar one or two, there's been a, a reliance on fish or sharks to a certain degree as prey. You know, even in a place like Chatham, um, you know, Cape Cod, uh, 
you know, when we were there, I was chatting to the guys and saying, you know, well, you've got the white sharks inshore feeding on the gray seals, um, but what are these animals doing, you know, at other times of the year? Where do they go? Show me the movements. And they showed me the patterns where they were seeing these white sharks. And I said, well, what's our chair? So, well, the, that's where the guys catch the spiny dogfish. And when I was in Australia, I chatted to Andrew Fox and I said to, you know, Andrew, where do your white sharks, where did they historically go when they're not at the Neptune Islands? Or he said, well, and he showed me on a map, he said, these areas. And I said, well, you know, why did, why did they used to go there? He said, well, we used to have huge populations mm. of gummy sharks. And gummy sharks are what we call smooth hound sharks in South Africa. And I went to the museum in Port Lincoln and I started looking at, at a lot of the photographs of dead white sharks that they used to kill there. And inside these white sharks, they were full of gummy sharks. And then when I've dived on the seafloor with the great whites at Stewart Island off New Zealand, um, you know, there's, there's no real reason for them to be at Edwards Island, which is the main focal point, because the seals are strung out over huge stretches of the coastline. And when I've been diving with them there on the seafloor, what do I see there? A whole lot of spiny dogfish again. And, you know, in South Africa, where we look at where the white sharks occur here, you've got a seal colony and then close inshore in the three hotspots for white sharks. We'll call it four hotspots for white sharks in South Africa. Every single one is you've got a seal colony, whether it's False Bay, Dyer Island, Mossel Bay, or Bird Island. You've got a seal colony. But inshore of that, you've got areas with very rob historically robust populations of these small sharks. And that's where the white sharks are to be found in the summer months. And then if we take it one step further and we look at the necropsies done on 592 different great white sharks in the Natal Sharks Board Net over a 10-year period, which is the largest study of dead white sharks in the world, six, more than 60% of the diet of those sharks is made up of smaller, of, of the great whites, is made up of telios, so bony fish, and small sharks. So I just... I just cannot get it right in my head that people don't see if you remove all these small sharks, which no longer exist in False Bay and are now hugely depleted along the rest of our coastline. In fact, the superfin sharks have now just been listed as critically endangered, which I think we all know means imminently threatened with extinction. The smooth hounds are, have been lit listed as, as vulnerable. Um, if you take away their prey, they've got problems. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big deal that the prey has been taken out. And in today's day and age, I cannot understand how we in South Africa can condone the, the essentially fishing of a species to extinction to send it to Australia, a first world country who does not need to eat a threatened species of shark for fish and chips. And, yeah, we, you know, that's what we've really campaigned very hard for. And I think... My lesson going forward is not so much what we can do to save South Africa's sharks. It's more a case of I really want people to hear this in other parts of the world where they're so lucky to have great whites that you cannot manage just a single species being the great white. You need to manage the entire ecosystem in which it lives. Really, that's perfect. Yep, that's exactly and do you think the right tip. When you, when you mention you know, people in Australia eating them, do you think people know that they're eating shark and fish and chips? A lot of times fish and chips come... You know, they're breaded, you know, people just, I'm going to order fish and chips, you know, here in, in North America, it's usually cod or haddock. Um, do you, th but a lot of times if I ask people, Hey, what kind of fish did you have in your fish and chips? They're like, I don't know. Maybe it's cod. Maybe it's not. There are a lot of people who just don't know what they're eating. Do you think that's the case in, in, in sort of your history with this? Uh, do you think that's the case in Australia where people don't know what they're eating? Yeah. So I think it's a mixture. I think there's a significant part of the Australian population that's very aware that they're eating shark. It's been done for a long time. Um, I don't think that that population up until recently was fully aware that a large number of their sharks were coming from South Africa and the catastrophic effect it's having on our coastline. And there are campaigns now in Australia to make Australians more aware. Australians regulate their fishery very well. Uh, it's in, incredibly well monitored. Um, the compliance is very good. In South Africa, we have none of that. In fact, one of the three, mo in fact, the most successful demersal shark longlining vessel was caught in by ourselves because the government wouldn't go out and send their own patrol boats out. So we sent our boats out. 
we caught this longline fishing vessel fishing in South Africa's flagship marine protected area, catching these smaller sharks, including many hundreds of endangered smooth hammerhead sharks and others. So not only are they killing unprecedented numbers of these smaller target species, but they're also catching many vulnerable and threatened species as well. And, you know, this has all been brought to the government's attention, but sadly, for whatever reason, you know, they, they've just issued four new shark longline licenses to target essentially a critically endangered species. I mean, it's unthinkable. It's like issuing permits to hunters to go and shoot cheetahs and wild dogs to commercially sell them to somewhere else for, for jerky. It's, it's beyond me. Uh, now, one one thing I'd like to ask too is, as you know, it's seen. Obviously, you're you're very passionate about this, and and you've seen this happen not only to great whites, but you've seen the changes in sort of the fisheries that have been happening uh, in in all these in, in these four bays and along the coastline. Um, you know, you've made your career documenting sort of the behavior of animals, especially the great whites, and really bringing people's attention to the great whites to, to really say, hey, you know what, these are really interesting animals, we need to bring, um, you know, more attention to them, we need to bring more protection to them. Uh, and you've done a, a fantastic job at doing that. Now, as things are shifting, and as things are changing, um, you know, from from a, a environment perspective, does like, how does this affect sort of your thinking of photography, your your business, your career, uh, it seems a lot like there's, there's you know, the way you're speaking right now, and, and, and you've done in other interviews as well, is talking about sort of the loss that and the changes that's happened to the great whites, but also the fisheries around and, and sort of the ecosystem. Do you think your next sort of shift is to move towards that behavior and not necessarily exposing, but bringing more awareness towards that behavior through your photography because it had such a great impact on bringing attention to great whites. Do you think that's uh, uh, an avenue that you're, you're going forth? And if not, you know, what avenue are you, are you going towards? Yeah. So Andrew, that's exactly what we're doing now. You know, I was lucky enough to be the individual who discovered the flying great white sharks. And I was sadly the individual who took the last ever photograph of them breaching. And for me, those great white sharks gave me unprecedented opportunities to see the world, all seven continents many times, work with the planet's most iconic species and some of the most amazing people who, who are doing good with those species. And the loss of the great whites really, I guess, w w it was essentially the, the, the last straw for me. And um, now I put together a collection of my life's work, my photographic work, a fine art collection that we sell to raise funds to actually purchase land in Southern Africa for a rehabilitation of habitat and ultimately rewilding. That'll be the legacy my wife and I leave behind. And we use our photographs, you know, a lot of people can't necessarily buy limited edition photographs, you know, we, we, we understand that. But we also use the photographs to, to tell the story, to raise awareness around the world of the fact that, you know, here's a photograph, with, if I'm using one of my flying great white shark photographs, here's a photograph of the most spectacular behavior ever exhibited by the most famous marine predator on our planet in its 50 million year tenure on this planet. And we have lost it in 25 years at Seal Island. And I think that's an incredibly powerful message. And, they, you know, there are many other stories like this. You know, South Georgia Island, 15 years ago, I watched glaciers carving off into the ocean. Three years ago, I walked in 400-yard-long canyons, 200 meters high, that the glaciers are no longer there. I, I camp in the hottest parts of South Africa under kookaburm trees 10 years ago. These trees are the botanical warriors on our planet. They've sustained the, the most arid conditions, but they cannot keep up with what's happening in the last 10 years. So through the, the privileged exposure I've had, I tell these stories visually through my photographs and I share the narrative from the coalface of what's happened. But equally important is my travels have taken me to extraordinary places where I still have seen the most iconic creatures on our planet. I've stood next to 
one of the last 30 great tuskers that I know is there today. I've walked in the in the in minor pools under the most magical trees you know that have got that's teeming with wildlife beaches of south georgia with five hundred thousand king penguins and there are unbelievable places on our planet that are still so worth protecting on our west coast of south africa we now have super pods of humpback whales you know in the in the 1980s humpbacks were, weren't seen they were almost made extinct in the 60s to a few hundred a few thousand animals last year I sat amongst a superpod of nearly 250 in the size of a football field so there are these incredible examples of what we can save and the younger generation are so much more in tune than mine was and certainly my parents and I you know I just really hope that the photographs can inspire them to be the next generation that doesn't say you know what used to be here. I want them to be the generation to say, look what we saved. We've got so much more than those idiots before us. And I think, you know, the photographs can play a huge part in that because they they are a, a, a chronicle and a chronology of, of our, our natural history. And these animals are what make our planet so special. And certainly for us in Africa, they define a continent. We cannot afford to lose them. They agree. Uh, Chris, this well has said. been very well said. Absolutely, uh, Chris. This has been uh, an amazing interview. Uh, you know, an amazing time to be able to speak to you and uh, to be able to bring this uh, to light. Uh, this is new to a lot of this is new to me, which I so I appreciate you taking the time to uh, letting us know about this and and kind of giving you insights and giving us insights into your career. And you know, it's it's been really interesting to see how you know animal behavior and 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 the way animals behave within an environment has driven your passion not only for, through photography but has inspired others uh, to follow the same path and and you know for our last question uh, of of this interview is do you have any uh sort of um advice for you know photographers who want to go professional or even professional photographers who are struggling just like you did and you know to find the right opportunity to find something that they are passionate about and to kind of be involved in conservation at the same time what type of advice would you give to our listeners who are going down that same path or who want to seek that same path yeah look be, making a success commercially out of wildlife photography is not easy um i think one of the things you, you need to avoid doing is being a, a generalist. There are a huge amount of generalists out there. You need to define your own style. You need to find your own niche. And you need to work bloody hard. You know, in terms of you need to knock on a huge amount of doors until you get one gallery that will show your work, until you can have an exhibition. And you, you just need to, you need to never give up, you know. And I think what's really important is to, constantly have exposure to that which you're passionate about and just by spending time out there you will develop your own style it isn't evolution you know my work now is very much more artistic in in, in inclination and it's it's got a lot more mood to it i, I don't sh shoot a lot of close-ups anymore it's usually just really wide stuff that tells the story of the environment and that was a progression for me you know other people have moved in in different directions but i think it's important to have focus. It's important to have a plan when you go out into the field. Um, know what you like. Have a plan how you're going to achieve it. And, you know, be prepared to put in significant amounts of time. And the rewards will always come. It's, it's like, you know, Gary Play, our famous South African golfer, he always said, and it's a well-known cliche, uh, the more I practice, the luckier I get. And um, you know, that's, that's very true. I say that this has been an amazing, amazing interview, Chris. I just your passion really comes through, and and just hear the whole trajectory of how you got into photographing the the flying sharks, but I think the broader picture in terms of the conservation and how what people can do to like to as you say make make a difference. You know, start local. You know, just work locally. Just make differences in your own community. I think is a really important message you share there, and and the stories you tell through your. Uh, photography are incredible. I hope people, as you get some of your your books that are out there and some to come, that people people go out and get them because. Are there any books in the in the works right now that are coming out? Any new ones? 
Um, actually, Dave, my, my wife's working on a really interesting book where we, <laughs> we've got a pretty crazy situation now. You know, we, we don't spend that much time on our, our boat that goes to sea with our, our guests anymore. We've got a smaller boat. We, we go out and we focus a lot more on general natural history. And our, our dogs have been coming to sea with us for the last uh, seven or eight years. And I hate to say it, these dogs have seen more than what 99.9% .9 of the planet's seen. And um, I was writing a kid's book that really tells the, the, the story of the interrelationship of, between species through the dog's eyes. Because the dogs have had these incredible experiences. We've got great photographs of, you know, a great white putting its head out the water, looking at the three dogs, looking down at it, penguins sniffing the dog's snouts. And um, it's amazing how the animals actually interact with the dogs. And so it's to tell the, how the dolphins basically uh, relate to a, a ball of bait and how the gannets, when they fall out the sky, how they've got shock absorbers in the corners of their wings to absorb that shock when they hit the water. And the animals, it's a fantastical journey, but they tell the story of the complexities of nature to the dogs and that's expressed to the kids. So that's that's one really fun and different book my wife's working on. It's going to be called Sandy and the Salty Sea Dogs. And then, um, and then I'm busy... I'm busy getting close to um, finishing up uh, basically my life's history on on working at Seal Island and the incredible the incredible story that Seal Island was and um, yeah not really telling my part telling their part and telling the world that story of the Great Whites that so desperately needs to to be used as a as a lesson going forward. I think we're gonna have to have your. I think we're gonna have to have your wife on a, few, a future podcast when her when her book comes out, and uh, and certainly when yours comes out, we'll have to have you back on again, Chris. This has been incredible. This has really been incredible. Thank you so much thank for you. coming on. Yeah, we definitely appreciate it. Thank thank you to, thank you thank you to both of you and you know, um, yeah you know Andrew, thank you for giving me this platform to to speak to you and and, and share the lucky experiences I've had. And, and Dave, you've been a, an inspiration to so many sharky people around the world. I mean, your books, your books have opened the eyes of, of, of many. And, uh, you know, I know, I know uh, a lot of people know this about you, but you've been somebody that's been passionate for, for so many decades. You've, you've pulled back the veneer of secrecy behind so many lesser known sharks and um, yeah, I just wish you to go from strength to strength because the world needs to see more documentaries done by people like yourself that actually focus on the uniqueness of the sharks and than us blowing steam up each other's asses and talking nonsense. So yeah, <laughs> what a you. way to put thank it. You. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chris. We really okay. appreciate you dedicating this time uh, and, and letting us know about your career and, and about your experiences. Looking forward to get, having both of those books uh, from your wife as well as you. And we'd love to have you back on to promote that as well as when Dave said, but your wife as well. And we appreciate the legacy that you've built. And, and uh, you know, we look forward to continuing that contribute, like help seeing you contribute to that contribution um, or to that to that legacy as we go as you move forward into your career. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, guys. Take care.